This morning we continue our sermon series on spiritual resilience. And our scripture text today comes from the letter of 1 Peter, the second chapter, verses 4 through 10, and we hear these verses for us this morning. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture. See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. For for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner. And a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let us pray together. Gracious God, may the words in my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It was in my young adulthood that I was first introduced to an author by the name of Henry Nouwen. And many of you may know that particular author. The very first book that was put in my hands to read was entitled The Wounded Healer. I read that book almost in one sitting. It was an easy read and as if Henry Nouwen's, the way he wrote, just kind of resonated with my soul. I just couldn't get through that book fast enough. And then I began to research other books that Henry Nouwen had written. There was something about his words, the spirit of his language, the way he talked about the cultivation of one's closeness with God made sense to me. I read, have read most of Henry Nouwen's books up to now. One of the last books I read of his was entitled Adam. And Adam was named after a man that was in a care facility that he was a pastor of. Maybe his last calling as a priest, as a Catholic priest, was at a place in Toronto, Canada called the Larch Daybreak Community. And as pastor of that community, one of the people in that care facility's name was Adam. Adam couldn't speak, and Adam Adam could not move without the assistance of of others to help him move. And Henry Nouwen said throughout his entire life of writing and teaching and pastoring, he said he learned more about the gospel and his relationship with Adam than just about anybody in his life. He was inspired by Adam's will to live and to have a life of worth When most people would think if you can't speak and you can't move, you don't have much worth at all. But every day when Henry Nouwen would visit Adam, there would be a new inspiration, a new marveling at the human spirit that he saw in Adam. And one of the things he admired most about Adam is that Adam would give love to others when he was strong. And yet at the same token, he was willing to receive love when Adam was at one of his weakest places, whether mentally or physically. And he said that genuine openness to give love and to receive love taught him so much about what the gospel of is really all about. It was that person of Adam for Henry Nouwen that gave him a deeper inspiration for all people in the world, regardless of who they are, that, and regardless of whatever 
challenges are in their life, that each person has something significant to contribute to the world that God created us to live in. So I was thinking of Adam's story. It was a story that came to mind in thinking about this passage from 1 Peter. Now before I talk about the actual text itself, I want to talk about the audience of the text of 1 Peter. Those that were recipients of this letter were churches, but they were churches out on the margins. They were churches out on the edge of the geographical landscape of the Christian movement at the time. They were churches in Asia Minor, and in modern day we would call that Turkey, but churches in Asia Minor. And they felt probably a little bit lonely or isolated from churches that were kind of closer in, that felt more connected toward Jerusalem, more toward the center of how the church was birthed. And they felt they were kind of not only distant by geography, but distant in connection. And they were feeling a sense of, what's our place? We are living under Roman occupation, and our identity seems tenuous. How do we keep going when we're not sure we have the stamina to keep going? And that's when the author of 1 Peter writes this letter and disseminates that letter out to those churches in Asia Minor. And they get to chapter 2. And the word of inspiration to those early churches was, think of yourself as living stones. And you're to build yourself into this spiritual house. The author of 1 Peter was trying to give an image or a metaphor by which they could understand themselves, maybe more importantly, develop strength in their own identity about themselves, even if they seem far away from the center of the Jesus movement. The author of 1 Peter was trying to say, you have so much to give right there in the place where you are. Don't worry about where you're not. Worry about where you are and what you can do and what you can accomplish and what you can be as a congregation there to those that are in your midst and within your arm's reach of serving and caring for. You have so many gifts and talents just within your own community. If you only have eyes to see and eyes to discern what's already around you. I shared with the kids this morning that each of us has gifts, more than one if we really are honest with ourselves. And we can be proud about the gifts we bring, but when our gifts are combined with other people's gifts and we build all those gifts together, the relational quality of who we are as a church just begins to blossom and flourish and all the things we can do. And I'm better not because of who I am, but because of what you bring to me, what you bring to us, what I bring to you, and what we bring together as a community of faith. We allow this spiritual house, which is relational in nature, to be the driving force for our identity and our thriving as a community. The challenge for us is when we let the institutional parts of ourselves get in the way of the relational parts of ourselves. And it's natural as any organization develops over time, we become more institutionalized. It's just the nature of organizations. When you're early in your formation, there's a lot more freedom, it seems, and as you get more people and more of a gathering of people, we need to kind of create a process and an organization and a structure to ourselves, and sometimes the structure gets in the way of being who we're supposed to be. There's a feminist theologian by the name of Mary Hines. He's actually from the Catholic tradition, and she says... Many times we let the governmental parts, the institutional parts of ourselves lessen who we really can be. When we let the institutional parts of ourselves get in the way, we minimize or diminish the church. And she names two very strong 
diminishing qualities within our own tradition. We could even say they're in our tradition within the Protestant realm of the church. One of those is patriarchy, knowing that the history of our church has been dominated and controlled by men throughout history. And when women are not included in that decision-making and history and shaping, the church is only half of what it can be. And she also says, in addition to patriarchy, there's hierarchy. When it's a top-down, when those that are elected or those who have higher office determine what happens to others, it's a top-down controlling system. It also limits the potential of people. When the institutional parts of ourselves get in the way of the relational quality of who we are called to be, the church can't be who the church is called to be. The living stones of God's people can't flourish and find their way amongst others and allow the church to see its true potential. We must always be exploring, evaluating, and thinking about our identity and maintaining and ensuring that the relational qualities of the church are at the fore of everything we are called to do. Yes, we need structure. Yes, we need organization. Yes, we need ways of of governing ourselves. But it should not get in the way of our ultimate purpose of being God's people on earth and sharing Christ's love wherever Christ's love is meant to be shared, both in and beyond the walls of the church. Tim Shapiro, who is a Christian author and consultant, writes about learning congregations. And learning congregations are ones that explore, discover, fail, and explore again. They recognize that they should not be limited by how they're organized, but should be governed by their creativity and by the gifts that exist in the church. And reflecting on Shapiro's thoughts, a thought came to me that maybe sometimes the church spends so much time protecting its identity, it limits its ability to reach its full potential. If I'm trying to protect something and spending all my energy protecting what the church is, then I have no energy being used of being who we can be at the same time. The church is this powerful place. And one of the things we gather from the early church is some of that organic quality that we are never to lose. The organic quality is the church is made of people. As beautiful as the sanctuary is, as beautiful as the church is, for it creates kind of a mindset and a spirit that shapes our thinking, the very center of who we are is the people of Christ. In this place, all that we bring, all that we learn from one another. I've shared in a previous congregation when a person would join the church, I would say that two things happen when a person becomes a part of the church in a more formal way. One, the church benefits by the gifts that person has and brings to that church gifts that didn't exist otherwise. And at the same time, the church provides a place for that, for that person to be nurtured and strengthened and grow in their own faith. It's almost like a two-way street. But both the entity and the individual benefit from each other in that relationship. challenge for us is to never think we have arrived with our relational qualities in the church. The church universal has a long history of excluding, demeaning, and hurting people through the generations. Maybe it's by the color of their skin. Maybe it's because of their orientation or their gender identification. Maybe it's because of their age or their background. 
there are millions of people walking this earth with scars from their experience of the church. The church is not exempt from being a place that creates pain. But the church is also a place of grace and reconciliation and possibility to be that which is more than we've been. There is a poem by Robert Frost entitled The Mending Wall. And I can't recite the actual poem, but the story of the poem unfolds is that there is a stone wall that is in between two properties. And it's a kind of a dry stack stone wall. And over time and through the seasons of the year, stones kind of fall off the wall. And in the poem it says that the two neighbors once a year will meet at the wall because some stones have fallen on one side of the property and other stones have fallen on the other side of the property. And these two neighbors commit that once a year they will rebuild the wall that divides them. And it takes both of them to be there together to be on their side and create kind of common space, to create this common component. That the wall itself is not a wall of separation, but a wall of connection and possibility to appreciate the other. I'm so grateful for the identity of this church. It's welcoming of, of all people. And yet there's still more to be welcoming within our church. We just yesterday had 60 plus people exploring and talking about anti-racism. What it means to be an anti-racist person, an anti-racist community, an anti-racist church. And as welcoming as we have been through the 30 years of this church, there is still a wide expanse of welcome yet to be explored. As much as we can pat ourselves on the back, we can say we still got so much of the journey yet to see, yet to accomplish, yet to explore. But the great thing is we are not left to our own devices as this relational community of faith. We're reminded in the passage in verse 10 when it says, Once... You were not a people, but now you are God's people. As we celebrate the relational gifts of who we are, that there is a higher presence, a higher being that we lean towards and lean into to give us guidance and strength for our life. For for it to be that thriving learning, vibrant community of faith. We've got to do it as a spiritual house. We've got to do it as collective spiritual stones, being the house of faith grounded in God, grounded in the presence that created us and sustains us and calls us forward. Because without God at the center, we are not a people. But through God and with God and in God, we are the spiritual house, the spiritual house of God that God intends us to be. Thanks be to God. Amen.